Ba -do 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 -do. Hey, what's up, guys? Good morning and happy. As always, hope everyone had a good weekend. Hope you had good weather. Hope you took your dog for a minimum of five walks. But all right, guys, I'm uh, I'm kind of on vacation mode. Um, I'll be trading this week. I'll be streaming this week. But I'm waking up at like one o'clock in the morning tomorrow, and I am hitting the road off to Orlando. But all right, y'all. So a couple of things here on the futures. So right now I'm trading the futures. And a lot of what I'm doing is just overnight credit spreads. If I think the path of least resistance is lower, I'm selling the call credit spread. If I think we're going higher, I am selling the put spread. And I think a good reference level or a good levels to reference rather for the, uh, the futures trades of these quant pivots. So I know a few of you are probably familiar with this, but the, uh, you know, take the daily quant pivots. So every day you get a couple levels here. Here we go. All right, so you've got H1 and H2. And those are your two red levels up here. So that bad boy is H1 and that bad boy is H2. So a couple of stats for you. We are only going to touch... Now, this is analyzed over about 300 periods. So over the last 300 days, we're only going to touch H1 about 33% of the time. We are only going to close above H1 about 20% of the time. We will touch H2 around 42.95. We'll touch that about 15% of the time, and we'll close above that 8% of the time. And then you've got your L1 and your L2. So we'll touch L1 about a little bit less than 40% of the time. We will close below L1 about 17% of the time. We'll touch L2 14% of the time, and we'll close below that about 6% of the time. So for my futures trades, these levels are a big reference. And what I'm looking for is one of two things, either... You know, for example, either we're rallying into a level or, uh, or flushing into a level. So this morning, for example, price comes down to that daily L1. And now you've got the stats here telling us, all right, we're down here at daily L1. We're only going to get down here about 35% of the time. We're only going to close below that level 18% of the time. So there's a better than 80% chance that we're probably not going to go too much lower than 42.20. So the first thing that tells me is, eh, I might want to be a little chill here about getting short. Better yet, we're pulling back. Now think of the options. All right, what's going on here with the options as we're pulling back? Think of the 42.20 puts. Think of the 4200s, the 4190s, 4180s. They're getting all kinds of premium blown into them like... Uh, like a big balloon. So it's a little bit like this. Where's my uh, where's my eclipse? You know, on the flush, on that move down towards daily L1, all kinds of premium getting blown into those puts. So they're getting inflated like a balloon. Now, if price even just stalls out, like never mind uh, a big reversal, a big rally, if we flush towards daily L1, and then everything's just a bit more choppy. We, uh, you know, we generally kind of hang around that level. What happens to those puts? All that hot air, all that premium getting caked in on the flush, it gets sucked right back out. Now, your window of opportunity here, um, let's call him Billy. Billy wants to buy some puts down here at the extremes. All right, Billy is looking for a bloodbath. But we've got a level. We've got some probabilities to anchor to as far as eh, we might bounce here. Rather than get short, I might want to sell Billy that put. Hey, Billy, you uh, <laughs> you want to buy the 4200 put? All right, I got you. I'll sell it to you. And then if we do hold here, all that premium is going right into my account. So if we're flushing into L1 or L2, if you get signs of a turn... All right, now signs of return for me might be, all right, my five-minute chart has gone from, from blue to green. All right, I got the green bar. I got the five-minute buy signal. 
and I'm getting a shift here of the ATR trailing stop. We came down to a key level. The odds would tell me decent chance we could bounce here. Now, I'm not going to blindly jump in. But at that level, if I get a five-minute shift, we get a buy signal, the trailing stop goes positive. Now I might sell Billy that put. And then vice versa. Say we're rallying towards H1 or H2. We're up here at 4280. We're up here at 4300. I'm going to wait for signs of a turn lower. We're up here. We get a five-minute sell signal. The trailing stop shifts. All right, Billy, you, uh, you want that 4280 call? You want that 4,300 call? I got you. I'm happy to sell it to you. So I'm a fan of trying to sell options in the uh, in the opposite direction at the extremes. The other trade is kind of like last night. We're hanging out at the midpoint. So we're not at uh, an upside extreme. We're not at a downside extreme. That's where I think you're looking for a lower time frame squeeze. Could be a 15 minute, 30 minute, one hour, four hour. But if you're at the midpoint, you're at the white line, you find something like eh, this 15 minute squeeze overnight. You can try to play that squeeze short from move into what? I think ideally down into that first green line, daily L1. You ride the 15 minute squeeze short. Daily L1 says, hey, pretty good spot to. Uh, Maybe take a few chips off the table. Maybe pay yourself. You caught a nice flush. Don't be a pig down here at L1. Down here, your puts are up 50%. And we're bouncing. Now they're up 25. Now they're flat. And she keeps pushing. Now you got a loss. So that's um that's kind of the, uh, the gist of it as far as my overnight futures trades. I'm taking advantage of the credit spreads. And one thing I'm a fan of, um, like, for example, my Monday trade, so today's trade, I put this on on Friday. So on Friday, I sold a call credit spread. I woke up this morning that it collected about 800 bucks of profit. So my daily goal is 1000 bucks. That's what I like about the futures. A lot of times if I sell that spread... I wake up in the morning, I'm getting ready for the gym. It's uh, it's 3.30, 4.30 in the morning. A lot of times I got some good cash flow coming in. Now, the other trade you can do, um, and to be transparent, this is kind of my first time doing it. You know, what are the odds of us closing inside of the extremes? What are the odds of us closing, you know, somewhere above L2 and somewhere below H2? Well, the odds of a close between those two, it's about 85%. So over the last 293 days, 85% of the time, we're going to close somewhere below H2 and somewhere above L2. So again, it's my first time doing it, um, but you can throw a condor on. So now I'm short the 4,300 4, calls. I've got my short call up there at H2. I've got my short put down yonder at 4,200. Well, chill out here. What am I doing? Clicking buttons too fast. But yeah, short put down here at 4,200. Now, the risk, of course, is you know today is the 15% of the time that we're going to plunge below H2, um, or L2, excuse me, or rally above H2. And that, of course, just requires managing the trade. So a couple things there on the futures. Um, now, as far as mama market, we got some things to discuss here, my friends. So quant pivots. All right, so here's a scoop. Um, the signals do not look good. The charts do not look good. Structure does not look good. Momentum does not look good. We got a couple of squeezes that don't look good. And the, uh, the news is not good. So that combination of crappy looking charts, bad news, it can drive a lot of fear. A lot of fear translates to a lot of people buying puts. And mind you, there's going to be times where the uh, the seesaw, so to say, leans heavily towards the put side and everybody's getting paid. All right, Everyone and their mom is getting short. 
and everyone and their mom is getting some cash. There's also times, good example would be October 4th, where everyone and their abuela loads up on those puts. Following day, big short squeeze. I'm not calling for either or, but just keep that in mind. When, uh, you know, when every animal in the jungle, so to say, is crowding around the same watering hole. Room for shenanigans. So, um, you know, what's ugly about the market? We're under the 50. We are under the 21. The 50 is trending lower. Right? Never a good thing. The 21 EMA is trending lower. And now we're trading under the 200. So every uh, every trading textbook would tell you, no bueno. To make matters worse, we got a whopper of a squeeze here. That squeeze far is short. We're probably going to go much lower. You go up to the weekly chart. The weekly makes, I think, uh, it makes things even more interesting. What's bad about the weekly? Well, we've got one, two, three, four, five going on potentially six weekly closes under the 21 EMA. Never a good thing for the bulls. Another problem here is going to be momentum. You'll see back here in November, they finally cross momentum back above that zero line. First, they fix momentum. Then they fix up the structure. Back above the 21, back above the 50. 21 crosses through the 50. Then they print the squeeze. They have the ultimate combo. Bullish momentum, bullish structure, and a squeeze. It all worked as advertised. Beautiful push. Yeah, Now we've pulled back. We have another squeeze. And now momentum is going the wrong way. So probabilities-wise, we cannot look at the current weekly squeeze. And at least for now, think it's going to do what the, uh, the squeeze back here did. Not every squeeze is created equal. Whether or not it's in an uptrend, whether or not it's in a downtrend. Back here, we're above the moving averages. We got good momentum. Right now, we're below the 21. And we got a negative cross. So typically, that's going to point towards pretty good chance of weekly squeeze fire short. Now, to play uh, devil's advocate, so to say, the one thing they do still have, at the moment, price holds above the 50. And the 50 is still trending higher. You'll also notice your 200 SMA still trending higher. So in the context of a potential weekly uptrend, they get a big squeeze. Squeeze fires long. Now, typically, you would expect some support at the 21. I don't think the biggest deal in the world to come down and get the first test of the 50. Squeeze fires in March. Here we are, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Seven months later, pulling back to the rising 50. So what I'm trying to say is if the bulls are going to save themselves, that's the level to hold. The combination of a daily squeeze and a weekly squeeze, if we break under that level, um, it can certainly get pretty ugly. If they can hold here, so let's call it, we'll call it 4,200. If they can hold here, then I think there's a chance it can get, uh, they can try to trigger some kind of bounce. All right, now here's where things can get a little bit uh, a little bit interesting. Parts look like shit. Everyone's getting short. And if you look at the put call ratio, the last time we saw this hanging around these readings, 1.2, 1, 1, 1. The last time you saw that was October 4th. At the peak of the put buying, Two days later, we got the short squeeze. I'm not calling for a short squeeze. I'm not advocating wake up and get long. All I'm trying to preach is everyone's bearish. The news is scary. Everybody's buying puts. 
if price can hold that weekly 50, they might catch the bears a little bit off sides. Um, and if anything, just trigger a decent bounce. Below the weekly 50, I think she is screwed. Um, so for those of y'all in the options room in the mastery, we've got a couple condors that expired this Friday. And just, uh, you know, for transparency, easy to talk about the, uh, the victories and winning trades. You got to talk about the mistakes. We've been doing the condors for five weeks in a row. So every Friday, we sell an iron condor for the following Friday's expiration. It worked week one. It worked week two. It worked week three. It worked week four. Week five is getting a little bit, little bit suspect. The mistake I made, um, and I know better. I know, I know better. Don't do a freaking iron condor if you have a, if you have a squeeze. I think it's like the uh, the complete wrong timing. What is a squeeze? Right. It's compression that leads to what? It leads to a bigger than expected move. What is the last thing you're looking for if you're selling an iron condor? A bigger than expected move. You're not looking for two, three, four days of a rally. You're not looking for two, three, four days of a flush. You want you want this. Yeah, we go down a little bit. We go up a little bit. We go down a little bit. We're not getting a multi-day trend. During that period of time, yeah, the Condor might be the best trade. Sell some calls up here. Sell some puts down here and, uh, and go walk the dog. But you try to place that bet that the market's going to be well-behaved and quiet inside of a range when you've got a daily squeeze. Awful idea. In my, in my opinion, I think really crappy trade. So that was probably the uh, the mistake of last week. The trade that makes, I think, a lot more sense. All right, I've got a squeeze. Let me sell some call credit spreads. If I've got a squeeze and a sell signal, that's kind of telling me clear as day. We're gearing up for a big flush. Don't sell the put side. Just sell the call side. And then guess what? If the market just trades sideways and you've got some short calls up here, hey, you're in good shape. Market actually goes a little bit higher. You still might be in good shape. Market goes down kind of slowly, a little slow grind. You're in good shape. Market gets uh, destroyed. You're in good shape. In the absence of that squeeze, 80% of the time, I like the condor. Sell some calls and sell some puts. You get a squeeze printing. You got to pick a side. So what I'm thinking here for the uh, the Condor guys, the line in the sand. And remember, just as easily as we could roll over and just puke it up. When a lot of folks are getting short, it doesn't take too much for a quick, you know, boom, one, two percent rally. Which honestly doesn't change too much. You play it to the upside, you probably short it at some point. But the uh, the level here, guys, is going to be that weekly 50. If they test that level, um, how's the futures? Let me see. How are we looking? Um, so we're not going to be there at the open. Uh, but if the market's down closer to like 1% today, you know, we'll be down towards that weekly 50. And that is where the rubber meets the road. I think one of two things. You either uh, you break that level and it's just down goes Frazier. Or that level does hold. They try working on a little bit of a bounce. And then just put yourself in the shoes of somebody who continues to get heavily short. So mentally, put, your sh put yourself in the shoes of the... Uh, of the guy or the gal on Friday who just aggressively buys those puts all the way into the close. Banking on a market collapse, banking on a, a margin call Monday. Every little tick the market goes higher, they're feeling that. And the bigger they got short, the more size they put on, the more they feel that. They're feeling it at 42.30. 
They're feeling a little bit more pain at 4240. We get cranking through 4250. They're really feeling it. At some point, they can't take the pain. They got to throw in the towel. And there's your short squeeze. Right? Same thing that happened back here. So watch that. And then I think the uh, I think the wild card here is going to be Dixie above or below 106. Dixie below 106. Dixie being the dollar, the buck. If we uh, if we can get the buck under 106, better chance we see that bounce in the market. Vice versa, the dollar is taking out 107. Um, you know, buy puts and close your eyes. But it's kind of interesting. I know the um, I know a lot of the selling pressure over the last one, two, or three weeks. You know, definitely a lot of it's getting attributed to the news. You know, a little bit bigger picture, kind of stepping outside of the news. The uh, the strength here in the dollar from July up until recently, that's put a lot of pressure on the market. Momentum crosses positive. From there, they kind of walk it up. It even got to the point where it fired a weekly squeeze. And that weekly squeeze gives it the uh, the momentum, the energy, the gasoline to keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. But as we know, all good squeezes come to an end. The squeeze fired long one, two, three, four, five, six, seven weeks ago. A good weekly squeeze will take you seven, eight, maybe 10 weeks. So probabilities wise, we're closer to the end of this push than we are to the beginning. So take that into consideration. The weekly squeeze might be over. And then over here on the daily chart, now momentum's going the wrong way. Going the wrong way if you're bullish on the dollar. Negative cross, brand new daily squeeze. So now what I'm saying is under 106, under that 21 EMA, we could see the dollar grind down towards that daily 50. Potentially lower if the squeeze does break short. So different things I want you to watch and be mindful of this week. Um, and again, let me just be the first to say, when there's a weekly squeeze of the sell signal and a daily squeeze of the sell signal, nobody here should be surprised if we go much lower. But I want you to take into consideration, this is kind of the first, uh, you know, the first pullback to a weekly 21, or the, uh, the weekly 50, excuse me, really since the potential weekly uptrend started. Doesn't mean we hold, but just be mindful of that. Could be big support. Be mindful of the fact that a lot of people continue to get short into potential big support. And then a big part of the uh, the weakness as of late, the dollar, potentially showing signs of some exhaustion. So things to watch. And then, uh, of course, we've got earnings. I think we've got, don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure this week we got Apple, um, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. If not all of them this week, then next couple of weeks. But all right, y'all, any, uh, any questions, anything you want to take a look at, throw it on at me. And then I got to go hit target real quick. Get ready for my road trip. If you guys and gals got any good podcasts, um, any podcasts, any audiobooks, I'm open for suggestions. Um, all right, NVIDIA. Let's take a look at NVID. I don't think uh, I don't think Nvidia announces for another couple of weeks. As far as the big boys, they're usually kind of last to go for it. All right, Nvidia. So the daily chart's in pretty rough shape, and look at the pattern here. Momentum peaked back in June. They've got all these failed attempts to uh, to fix it. 
They try to cross it above zero. They try to push the price higher, and boom, right back down. They try to get the positive cross. They try to break out, boom, right back down. They try to get the positive cross. They try to push it higher, right back down. So we're looking at one, two, three, call it four attempts to try to get things going. And they just keep dropping the ball. As far as momentum goes, and now as far as structure. And, um, you know, where that failure to fix momentum and keep it at a, a bullish point. I think it's a little bit risky. Is a fact all that's taking place here inside this big weekly squeeze. The more that daily chart continues to uh, degrade, structure gets worse, momentum goes lower. All that's going to do is have a negative influence on the weekly squeeze. And you'll see here, momentum crosses positive in November. And now you're getting that negative cross. So the uh, the level to defend here for the bulls is going to be 414-ish. Look at the um, look at the big air pocket under the weekly twenty one. Call it four hundred bucks. You got all that open space there before your next big level of support. So for Nvidia, I think you're watching the uh, the weekly here. And now who knows? Maybe earnings comes out. Uh, when is it earnings? When are you reporting? Yeah, not until like late November. So we're going to have to wait for a while. But maybe earnings uh, cleans things up a bit. Maybe, just maybe. Yeah, Andrew, the, uh, the Bitcoin futures actually look, dare I say, gorgeous. They look gorgeous. Yeah, man, you're going to love this. So beautiful weekly squeeze. Just fired long. Hold on, there's more. Three day squeeze with a buy signal. Hasn't fired long yet. So that's still coiled up. Hold on, there's more. Check out the two day squeeze. That just fired. That party just started. And then the daily squeeze. Whoops. The daily squeeze. Come on, toss. Daily squeeze fired on Thursday. So for swing trading, I love that combo. I love that combo. You know, you've got like three or four bigger time frames. They've all got the compression, meaning they've got the squeeze. And now even better, each of them prints a, uh, a buy signal. So domino effect. You've got the, uh, the daily squeeze. You've got the two-day squeeze. You've got the three-day. My God, it's like I'm drunk. You've got the three day and then you've got the weekly. Some of the uh, the other traders, they write really well with this uh, this drawing tool. But anyways, the daily squeeze fires. That releases energy. That release of energy might trigger the two day squeeze to fire. That releases more energy. That might trigger the three day. The, tr uh, the three day might trigger the weekly. So for me, it's the kind of thing I would love to buy a pullback in. Better yet, I wish I bought it back here in that daily squeeze. Because now you're uh, you're just off to the races. But I like it. I think on a pullback, it's, uh, it's a good candidate for uh, a little bit of dip buying. All right, futures just kind of sloshing around. A little bit of sloshing. Yeah, Art, those are, those are classics. Mastering the trade, classic. 
Best loser wins. Classic trading in the zone. Classic. Um, the price of time. Let me write that one down. That one I uh, I haven't heard of. Price of time. No, my uh, yeah. <laughs> so the plan is, um, and I don't require much much sleep as it is. You know, so the plan is I'll have dinner tonight. Um, after dinner, I'll hit the sheets. And then, you know, we'll probably hit the road at like one in the morning. So my hope is, I got a whisper here, but my hope is my wife maybe sleeps the first eight or nine hours. And then I got control of the, uh, the audio. That's a game plan at least, guys. That's a game plan. And I'm bringing my, uh, my sister-in-law. So we'll see if we're still a big, happy family. <laughs> yeah. 2,000 miles later. Yeah, Cameron, we can look at uh, Palantir. Absolutely. All right, Palantir. So it's a little bit of a tough call for me. Let me check the weekly. Hmm. Okay. I like the weekly. I am. Um, I like the weekly squeeze a lot. And I like the pattern here. Big squeeze. Fire is long. You get the first pullback. You get another squeeze. Potentially, you're kind of looking at a, a bull flag of sorts. Your first leg higher. First back test. A little bit of chop chop. From here, that squeeze could just give you continuation. Fire is long. Takes out resistance and goes into new highs. You know, the key for me is, all right, what's, um, what's going on inside of this weekly squeeze? Weekly chart for weekly chart, just, uh, just taking this thing at face value, it's beautiful. Momentum is above the zero line. The 50 is trending higher. The 21 is trending higher. 21 above the 50. We got a buy signal. I love it. But it's a little bit like buying a car online. Right, the car looks good. The body's in good shape. The paint looks good. The uh, the rims look good. Tires look new. And then you, you you buy the car. You show up in person, and there's no interior. The steering wheel is gone. There's no engine. Yeah, it looks pretty. It, it'll be nice to look at in the garage, but it ain't going anywhere because of what's missing inside of it. So going back to Bitcoin. What I like about the Bitcoin squeezes is they're all on the same page. You got a beautiful weekly squeeze, but if you look inside of it, you look at your three-day time frame, it's also bullish. You look at your two-day, it's bullish. Right? Everything inside of that weekly squeeze for Bitcoin points in the same direction. Now, Palantir, Inside the weekly chart, taking a look here at the daily. There's nothing wrong with the daily chart. All right, it's neutral. Eh, you're below your 21, but you're above your 50. Momentum's above zero. It's a little bit neutral. It doesn't scream to me, get short. It doesn't scream to me, get long. And if I'm thinking there's a good chance that weekly squeeze is going to fire to the upside... What I'm looking for is that moment in time where everything inside of it screams get long. So the um the poster child would be Netflix. Just like Palantir, Netflix had a, a beautiful weekly squeeze back in May. What made that one of the better trades of the year was the fact that everything inside of that weekly squeeze was just as bullish. 
inside the weekly squeeze, you had a daily squeeze and a buy signal. You had a two-day squeeze and a buy signal. You had a three-day squeeze and a buy signal. If I remember correctly, there was a four-hour and a two-hour. So you've got four, five, six different time frames. They're all squeezing. The momentum indicators, the structure indicators, everything points towards the same direction. Daily squeeze, ready to go. Two-day squeeze, ready to go. I like the Palantir weekly. What I would do is wait for a little bit more clarity for my lower time frames. You know, something as simple as a daily buy signal. Got a great weekly squeeze. My daily chart goes bullish. That could be enough. But all right, guys, I've got to let you go here. Um, what time is it? It is 9.23. So cash market's open in seven minutes. But all right, folks, I wish you uh, all the best of luck today. For those of you in the options room and the mastery, I'm watching SPX 4200. 4200 or the weekly 50. Uh, pretty much the same neighborhood. I am looking at that for potential support, and we'll take it from there. But all right, everyone, have a good day. Be safe, be disciplined, and I'll talk to you all soon. Adios.